I'm a bit OCD or neurotic or autistic or neurodivergent, whatever you want to say, but I have to have my questions answered or else like I just can't deal with life sometimes. Privyet Tavarashi Yawali and welcome back to my channel. I talk about gymnastics. I mostly react to old routines and do meet recaps, which is what I'm going to do today. But I wanted to mix it up a little bit. One thing I've learned in the last few weeks is how little a lot of people know about the back in machinations, what goes on behind the scenes in elite gymnastics. And I myself am guilty of this. Despite being such a huge fan of the 80s, I had no knowledge of those codes of points until quite recently. I definitely advise anybody who is interested in gymnastics, who wants to look at things critically, to start with the most important piece of the puzzle theoretically anyway, and that would be the FIG code of points. I know I complain a lot about the state of gymnastics today, but I have read the recent code of points. I'm familiar with it, so I know what is feasible, what isn't. I know why things are as bad as they are, but it feels like I'm the exception when it comes to the gymnastics fandom, the Gymtronet. We saw a lot of complaints after the 2022 Worlds when, in reality, if you look at the code of points, the results were not really that surprising. I have seen so many comments recently that have really astounded me. There seems to be this misconception that a lot of skills that were done in the 80s are now banned, and that's why we don't see them. That could not be further from the truth. As far as I know, the only skills that were done back then that are banned now would be the rollout skills on floor, like we saw from Shushinova. But it's really like somebody read that <laughs> Olga Corbett's backflip on the bar was banned, ergo all of old school gymnastics skills are now banned. But that is not true. The reason gymnastics looks so much different now than it did in the 80s has nothing to do with what skills have been banned and everything to do with the gymnastics bible, the code of points. The way that politics is so deeply interwoven into gymnastics judging, it, it's a lot. Skating is the same way. I heard during Worlds last fall, some people saying that there was only one British judge on the panel, uh, as though that absolved you know, any chance of shenanigans or something untoward going on, but that's not the case. You don't need to have five British judges to make something happen. Let's just put it that way. So I've recently immersed myself into the 85 to 88 code of points, and I wanted to look at the 1985 Europeans through the scope of that magnum opus. <laughs> And it has been so eye-opening in so many ways, I have learned so much. I love gymnastics history anyway, but especially when it relates to my favorite time, it's just been a gold mine. The 85 Europeans were held in Helsinki. The Soviets sent a trio of former and future world champions in Yelena Shushinova, Oksana Milianchik, and Natalia Yurchenka. And this was Shushinova's big international debut. She competed the prior year at the alternate games, but that meet was basically not seen by anybody. <laughs> she won the bronze in the all around there. I still pray that a day will come when decent footage from Ola Motes is released. We've earned it. We deserve it. You know, some of us have been fans for literal decades, three, four decades. You know, I got just a little taste of it with that video of Olga Mastapanova from Beam Finals that was a perfect routine. The 10 was more than deserved, and I know there's more where that came from. It just needs to see the light of day. So starting with Vault, there were some very difficult and challenging vaults that I don't think were ever performed. <laughs> this was the first code since the invention of the Yurchenka vault, and perhaps because of that, it had a relatively high start value comparatively. 
probably more so than it really deserved. A uh, layout Yurchenko vault was out of a 9.9 .9, and a Yurchenko tuck full was out of a 10. Ekaterina Zabo was the greatest benefactor of that vault here at Europeans. I think she scored a 9.95 with that vault twice in this competition, once in the all around and then once again in finals. Zabo won the silver medal here but it wasn't really deserved. I thought she was overscored every time she ran down that runway. Zabo was even gifted a perfect 10 for her layout Yurchenko full second vault in finals. The vault was too piked down, there wasn't enough power, but I guess when you're getting 995s for unstuck tuck Yurchenko fulls, the judges have no choice but to give you a 10 when you attempt to lay it out. The irony is that some people think that Zabo was underscored here on the other events, and we'll get there, but she definitely got the benefit of the doubt and then some on vaulting. This impacted Dogmar Kirsten the most. I really felt like she should have won the silver behind Shishinova on vault, but because Zabo was scored so egregiously, Kirsten's beautiful vaulting was overlooked, unfortunately. The story of this meet absolutely was Yelena Shushinova. She dominated here. She won four of the five individual events. The only one she did not win was Beam, where she still managed to get bronze. I think it was controversial that Shushinova even made Beam finals. She had the same score as Natalia Yurchenka in the all around, a 9825. But whereas I was hard pressed to find any deductions in Natalia's routine aside from the dismount, Yelena had a pretty big break on her series, and she also didn't stick the dismount. Shushinova's score in the all-around definitely was a bit of an overscore. I'm not sure what the tiebreaker was between the two to see who made it into finals. Maybe they counted all the scores. I just don't know why Shushinova scored higher than Yurchenko. What inspired me to look up the code was Natalia Yurchenko's beam score because I wanted to know how they came up with that number because I think that was probably the best beam routine she ever did with her full difficulty once she put in her eponymous layout step out mount. The code said you can only have a maximum of three pauses and they may have hit up Natalia for that. So seeing that angle and seeing where they could have found that deduction from, it you know it kind of quenched my thirst. It answered my question. Even if it wasn't true, at least I had an answer, right? And that is when we get into the format of this meet. There were two separate rounds. Each one had, I believe, a minimum of 36 gymnasts. And most countries had three gymnasts that competed in the all-around. But how it was determined, you know, which countries gymnasts competed in which sessions, I'm not really sure. For instance, the Soviet Union, in the earlier session, you had Omelianchik and Yurchenka, and then Shushinova in the later session. The reason this matters is because in gymnastics the scores tend to build as the night wears on, right? The scoring in the second session was always going to be higher. Shushinova definitely benefited from this, as did Maxi Ganauk, and they finished 1 and 2 in this competition. In fact, some of the scores that Yelena was getting by the end were just literally unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, she got a 9.975 on bars, and considering she had a huge leg separation on her ginger, she only did a double pike dismount, which wasn't the full end she was capable of. She was a decent bars worker, but I don't think she was really in the 9.975 category. She scored higher than Maxi on bars during the all-around, which how? That was a mistake. <laughs> because Yelena scored higher in the all-around, she had the lead over Maxi going into bars finals, but thankfully Maxi was able to get a 10, although Shushinova did a much better routine in finals, so they were able to tie for the gold medal on bars. In addition to bars, I mentioned that Shushinova's score was probably at least a half a tenth to a tenth too high on beam. I think she got a 995 on floor, which I don't have that much of a problem with, but this was before she started doing her double layout. So, I mean, that is kind of questionable. And she got a perfect 10 for her vault. Pretty much a textbook, your Chenko layout full. So I'm okay with that too. I tried to score all the medalists in the all around, Shushinova, Ganauk, and Emilianchik to see what I came up with. And I had Yelena first, 
and then I had Oksana and Maxi tied for second. So it was pretty tight between the three of them. There were so many fascinating things about this code of points. One thing I had a question about was on bars. It says that you could only do five skills in a row before doing a bar change. And I thought that might explain why Dogmar Kirsten, her score seemed a little bit low to me considering the routine she did. I thought she might have incurred a deduction for doing too many skills on the high bar before transferring. But then I saw that her 88 Olympic routine, where we all know she got a perfect 10 in finals despite hopping on the landing, that routine had even more at the top on the high bar before she, you know, changed bars. So I'm not sure if I don't know how to count bar skills or if they change the code mid quad. If anybody could help me with this, I would really appreciate that because I definitely wasn't understanding that. As you might have been able to tell, Balance Beam is my favorite event and it was just like so much about this code I thought was well thought out. It made sense. It forced risk and originality in gymnastics, which is sorely missing these days. This code was so fascinating when it came to beam. One of the special requirements was you had to perform a leap or jump with great amplitude. I love this requirement. I think the problem comes to determining what is great amplitude, right? We saw Ekaterina Zabo, both of her beam routines were judged, you know, kind of on the lower side, but it's clear that she did not fulfill the requirement of doing a jumper leap with great amplitude. I'm pretty sure that was a tenth of a point deduction. When you put in that deduction, her scores make perfect sense. Hanna Zichna had a similar issue in the all-around with her beam routine. I don't think she really met that requirement as well. But in the final, she did the exact same routine and there was like a six or seven minute conference, maybe even longer, before the judges could post her score. And I think they were, you know, conferring about this requirement because she really does not do a jumper leap with great amplitude. She still ended up getting a 9925, I think, which is interesting. I think the only reason they gave her that score was because it wasn't going to make the difference between she and Emilianchik when it came to the gold medal. Even though Zichna got a 9925, Oksana only needed a 99 to win the gold medal, which is exactly what happened. You know, obviously Oksana, her routine was a treasure. It's a marvel. I've reacted to it before. She never stops moving. She shows everything that you would want to see in a balance beam routine. She works backwards, forwards, and sideways. She does low beam work. She does turns. She does beautiful jumps, beautiful acrobatic elements, great gymnastic series. I mean, her two forward rolls into Corbett is one of my favorite combinations ever. It's it's just a cornucopia of delights, right? I, I love her beam routine so much. And she does the whole thing on releve with a smile on her face. Emilianchik really personifies the joy of gymnastics for me. Another beamer team that I really enjoyed here was Gabrielli Fanrich from East Germany. Unfortunately, she fell in the all-around, but I really liked her composition, and you really only know her as a bar specialist. She would be the bar's world champion later this year, uh, but she was really good on beam as well. So the jump or leap with great amplitude was also a special requirement on floor, but that wasn't nearly as much of a struggle, obviously. People seem to make that fairly easily. The thing about the beam requirement is it just makes so many future results fascinating. This was also a requirement in the subsequent code of points as well. So when you think of Alessia Dudnik, her beam routine in 89, where I didn't really see a jumper leap that fulfilled that requirement, yet she was still getting 10s. It really makes you realize how, I don't want to say corrupt, but um, it just really makes you wonder. Let's just say that. <laughs> Some other fascinating things about this code, skills that were already in this code, even in 1985. So the double Arabian off beam was already in the code of points. 
even though it wouldn't be named for Carly Patterson until 2004. So, you know, 19 years before the fact. I really feel like sports should get better as the years go by, and the exact opposite has happened with gymnastics. The gymnastics was so much better in the 80s and 90s than it is today, and it's not because all these skills have been banned the way people seem to think it is. It's because the code no longer requires risk and originality the way it did back in the 80s. Bring back ROV or OAV, bring back some kind of system like this so the gymnasts are rewarded for doing original and risky skills, because right now they're not and they have no incentive to. You could do a different skill that is easier, but has the same letter value. Why would you do the harder skill? It doesn't make any sense. That is all for me. Thank you so much for watching this, and please hit that thumbs up if you like this video. Please subscribe, check me out on Instagram. I post reels there almost every day of old classic routines from the 80s and 90s. I will see all of you guys in my next one. Bonjour, take care. Bye loves.